Okay, um, we're continuing in the, um, the series that we're doing of the uh, common misquoted or misunderstood uh, Bible verses. Tonight, we're going to be looking at uh, Philippians 4.13. Many of you probably already know it by heart. Maybe you don't know it by the address, but if I started it, you'd probably be able to finish it. And it says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, I mean, what's, what's the common understanding of that verse? What, normally, people use that verse to um, encourage themselves in, in what way? Yeah, sports. I, I looked into it, and it's amazing how many athletes, this is their, what they call the life verse. Um, one athlete, I forget his name, he actually has this scripture on the bottom of his shoes um, that he's going to stand on the word, you know. Uh, yeah, basically it's athletes, people who have dreams, goals, um, they have things that they want to do in life, and this is the verse that they will use to um, give them, basically, uh, support that they can do whatever they want to do. The mindset is, nothing is impossible. I can do anything. And they would look to this verse to support them in this. Um, in fact, this is a quote from a quote-unquote Christian website. Um, there is nothing impossible with God. And through him and his strength, there is nothing impossible for us. Now, the context of that, again, is your goals, your dreams, whatever you want to do. So, as was already said, athlete. So, you have an athlete who has a desire um, professionally. He wants to reach the Super Bowl. He wants to be in the NBA Finals. And, you know, he just keeps this verse close to his heart. I can do all things. I can reach that goal. He sees it. He sets out for it. That's his life's mission. He wants to accomplish that. Other people, they have education in sight. I have this degree that I want to get. I have this level of education that I want to achieve, and I keep this verse close to me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, and I'm going after that goal. Um, there's all manner of things that people would set before themselves as a goal, and they would use this verse to support themselves in their pursuit of it. Um, in fact, one of the, I mean, it, it, it's really astounding. Um, there's a boxer, his name is Manny Pacquiao, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Um, but after he knocked out a guy, blood all over the guy's face, he quoted this verse, I can do all things. Even knock somebody out in the name of Jesus. I mean, obviously, we see that there's something wrong with this. Um, this is not what this verse means. Um, this verse, believe it or not, actually has its own Facebook page with over 2 million likes. Um, and it's filled with motivational um, messages, uh, self esteem boosting little sermonettes and little, uh, you know, quaint little sayings and things of this sort. This is the common view that people have that this verse is meant to boost my self-esteem, boost my, uh, my inspiration. It's very, supposed to be very motivational for us to reach our goals. But is this what it actually means? I would say no. And I w we're going to look at two things tonight um, of what's wrong with this, what's wrong with this view. First, what's wrong with this is that the verse actually is preaching the opposite of what this mindset uh, is saying. In fact, the entire book of Philippians goes against this commonly held view of that you know that we already mentioned secondly this mindset is actually the pathway to destruction and we'll look at that as well um, 
So first and foremost, let's, let's, let's look at Philippians. Now, we're not going to be able to go through the entire book of Philippians verse by verse tonight, but what I did do is uh, I, look, you know, I looked at the book of Philippians myself, and I saw several places throughout Philippians that actually are um, giving an, an opposing message rather than you can do whatever you want to do and go after that no matter what. And the mindset that is common in Philippians is contentment. Contentment. So um, if you have your Bibles, Philippians 1.12. Philippians 1.12 says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Notice, Paul's in prison, and there's a rejoicing that's going on, saying that this imprisonment that he has is actually advancing the gospel. So what do we see? We see Paul in prison content. He's not saying... I have a goal to be out of prison. I'm setting that before myself and I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can get out of prison. No, he says, in prison, this is actually advancing the gospel. There's a contentment even when he is in prison. And if you know anything about Paul, he's not in prison because he, he murdered someone, because he stole, because he pillaged and raped. He's in prison because he was preaching the gospel. He's in prison for the sake of the Lord. So you can even say, in a sense, he's in prison unjustly. Similar to Joseph. He didn't do anything wicked. He didn't do anything evil, but he is in prison on behalf of the Lord. And rather than saying, I don't deserve this, I should not be in this situation, I can do all things through Christ, I'm getting out of here. No, he says that he sees how his imprisonment is actually advancing the gospel. And he wants his brothers to know this. Verse 14 continues with it. And most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So look, he sees that there's even more benefit. How is it advancing the gospel? The fact that he's in prison has and the fact that his contentment in prison and rather than murmuring and complaining, but rejoicing and praising the Lord in the midst of his imprisonment, even though it's unjust, has served to motivate the believers to be more bold with the gospel, to be more bold in proclaiming the truth, the very truth that got Paul put into prison. It's an amazing thing. Well, look at verse 15. There's more. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. You see that? So not only is he content in his imprisonment, he's content knowing that there are people preaching the gospel on purpose so that his imprisonment will be worse, so that he will be afflicted. And how does he deal with that? Well, I can do all things through Christ. I want them to stop because their preaching the gospel is afflicting me and making my suffering worse. No, he rejoices whether out of love or whether out of pretense he rejoices that Christ is being proclaimed and in that he rejoices. He has contentment even when people's actions are intentional for his harm. He has contentment in his imprisonment though it's unjust. He has contentment even when people's actions are intending 
to afflict him and to make his suffering all the more painful. This is the Christian life. As a Christian, do you find contentment even when people are seeking to do you harm? Do you find contentment even when you are being treated unjustly? Paul did, and we'll look at how soon. Look at verse 19. <clears throat> I'm telling you, Philippians is just filled with that. Um, so continuing from verse 18, he says, um, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Someone says, okay, look, there, see, he wants to get out. But keep reading. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that, will, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. His deliverance. He knows he will be delivered. How? He does not know, but he knows it will either be in life or in death. And regardless of how he is delivered, he rejoices. Here's another famous verse from Philippians. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you see this theme of contentment? In prison, he's content. Though he's being afflicted, he's content. He's saying whether life or death, I am still content. It's an amazing heart to have. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. Notice, his motivation is not himself. His motivation is not, well, yeah, you know, this is, these are my goals and my dreams and I'm going after them and so no, look, I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. That is the greatest desire, the greatest goal, the greatest dream. There is, there is, there is, no, there is nothing greater than to be with Christ. And Christ himself puts that forward as the proper motivation of the Christian. So that's not selfish. That's biblical. That's godly. That's Christ-like. That's right. That's right and true for your motivation to be, I want to be with Christ. But how is he going to get there? Through death. <laughs> and he's in prison, so he knows it's not going to come about by old age. That's going to come about through execution. So he says, for me to die, even if it's a torturous death, is far better. Why? Because I get to be with Christ. He has contentment even if he dies. Twenty-four, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He's still not thinking about himself. He's thinking about others. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Contentment. Look at verse 28. You know what? Since we're already, already there, why don't we just start with 27? Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, see that? Whether this or that, content. I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And notice this. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. It's an amazing thing there. It's a clear sign of their destruction and of your salvation. What is? That no matter what comes their way, there's no fear. There's no fright. Well, how can they have no fear or fright if the guillotine is raised above their head? How can they have no fear when the imperial guard, the Roman army themselves, are out looking for Christians? How can, no matter what their enemies come at them with, how can they not be frightened? It's a clear sign of salvation. 
Because the Christian has hope somewhere else. The Christian has joy somewhere else. The Christian has fear somewhere else. Didn't Jesus say, do not fear the one who can kill the body, but kill the one, fear the one who can kill the body and after that cast the soul into hell? I'm not going to fear you. I'm going to fear God. And if I fear God, then I'm going to walk in a manner that's worthy of my fear of his holiness. I'm going to walk in a manner that is worthy of the gospel by which I have been saved. You want to see whether or not, look, Jesus even said it in the parable of the sower. You want to see if someone's a true believer? See when persecution and tribulation comes their way and see if they depart. See when danger comes their way if they depart. If they are, if they do depart, then it shows that they were never truly of the faith. But if someone can stand firm in the midst of all manner of storm, in the midst of all manner of tribulation and persecution, and they stand firm because they stand upon the rock that is Christ, that is a clear sign of their salvation. And for everyone else around, when they begin to wash away, when they begin to flail their arms and they get lost in the sea that comes and the storms that come, it's a clear sign of their destruction because they're not standing upon the rock that is Christ. They have contentment no matter what comes their way because they have Christ. It's an amazing thing. And that is, that is the truth of all Christians. It doesn't mean that you will not have stumbles. It does not mean that you will not have falls. But you will not fall away. You will not wash away. When persecution or tribulation comes on account of the word, you will stand firm. Continuing on, verse 29, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Granted to suffer. Very strange uh, sequence of words. We may hear things like granted to repent. That's something we see in the scriptures. Granted to believe. That's something. Granted to have eternal life. You know, there's a, a reality that, you know, sometimes you will be uh, on a computer and you'll be typing away and you'll be trying to access a website and it may say, <laughs> access denied, <laughs> right? You're not granted access. It's something that you would like to happen, but you are denied access. Well, here we're told that the Christian is granted to suffer. Well, what does that imply? That implies that one can be in suffering and be content in the midst of that suffering. Not a, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, and that means I'm getting out of this suffering. That, that's the opposite. Like I said, we're, we're, we're getting to 413, but I want you to see how all throughout Philippians, there is this theme of being content no matter what the situation. And there's a reason behind it, and that is Christ. Okay, uh, Philippians 2, 5. Now we see the source, the source of the suffering, uh, rather the, sor the source of the contentment in the midst of the suffering. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what do we see? Christ was content in the midst of his suffering. Christ humbled himself. God Almighty, the mighty God, put on human flesh, stepped down into time, subjected himself to the laws of, that he created, gravity, the laws of physics and all of that, the laws that the human body must operate on food and sleep and clothing and shelter. 
subjected himself to these things. What humility that is. And rather than him being almighty God saying, you know what, Uh, this this is way below me. We see contentment. You don't see Christ saying, oh, I'm still in this flesh. No, there's contentment. He had his eyes set upon the joy that was before him. He had his eyes set upon his father and doing the will of his father. He had his eyes set upon his church, his bride. No matter what suffering he endured, no matter what suffering he faced, there wasn't murmuring, there wasn't complaining. There was contentment. This is our source. How do we know that? Look at verse 12. Therefore, everything that we just looked at about Christ, have this mind that, is, that was in Christ, let that be in you. Christ did all of this, humbled himself, being obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. All of that. Therefore, beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, see, not just then, but much more in my absence, whether I'm there or away. Work out your own salvation with fear and, and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling. You see, it's this theme. You're content no matter what. How? How can we be content no matter what? Look at Christ. Because you see Christ, let that mind be in you. That's why that word therefore is there. We just looked at Christ. When your eyes are on Christ, that gives you a therefore. That gives you a help. That gives you all the motivation, the inspiration that you need to come to the next verses that say, do everything without grumbling. But this is really hard. How can I not grumble? Oh yeah, therefore, remembering Christ, he didn't grumble. When temptation is difficult and no one's around me, it's, it's easy to obey when Pastor Tim's next to me. It's easy to obey me when the brothers are next to me. It's easy to obey me when, when I'm in the midst of the church. But when I'm alone, how am I going to find the strength to obey? Ah, therefore, because of what? Christ. Looking at Christ, whether away or close. Whether difficult or, hard or, or easy, regardless of the situation, contentment. Contentment. Verse 17. Uh, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Even if. How is Paul, what does that mean, poured out? Excuse me, as a drink offering. It means to be killed. Paul was executed. He was beheaded. Even if I'm going to be headed, I rejoice. It's one thing to say, look, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. It's another thing to know there is death at the door and it's approaching you and to say, in the face of death, I rejoice. That's a very different picture because we live our lives, you know, most people don't honestly think you can die at any moment. But listen, you can die at any moment. So can I. We don't normally live our lives that way. We don't think that way. If we did, we would act very differently. Many people just go through life as though, oh yeah, I'll die when I get to 60 or 80 or 90. The reality is you can die at any moment. Or Christ could come back at any moment. But it's another thing when you're looking at the acts of the executioner and it's being sharpened for your neck and you can still say I rejoice even if I'm going to be poured out as a drink a sacrificial offering for your faith I rejoice even if I'm going to go over to a Muslim country and have my neck 
cut from my body, I rejoice. Even if I'm going to be stoned to death, I rejoice. Even if I'm going to be shot, I rejoice. How? Have this mind in yourselves, which was in Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ, and you'll have that therefore (laughs) with you. Take your eyes off Christ, you will have no motivation. You will have no help in the midst of your suffering. In the midst of death looking at you. This is, this is real. Again, so many people are, are, uh, are, are willing to serve God as long as things go well. Many people have this, um, this clause in the contract of their Christianity. I will serve you. I surrender all, God, as long as fine print. As long as you allow my life to be basically problem-free. As long as you allow my life to go smoothly. As long as you do not take any of my family members away from me in my lifetime. As long as I can reach my goals. As long as these dreams, these visions, these ideas that I have in my heart. As long as you give me those, I'll serve you. You don't give me those. I'm not serving you. That's what a lot of people walk around thinking. And you don't know that that's your thought until something gets touched, until something gets taken, until something gets tested. Then you say, whoa, what is this that's rising up in me? What is this rebellion? What is this animosity towards God? Where did this come from? It's because you had a clause. You had the fine print. You say, yeah, I'll serve you, God, as long as... You had an idol, and the Christian will have no idols in their hearts. The Lord will touch every idol and crush them. That's the promise of the covenant, and God does that. And if he goes to crush an idol and you take it away from him and hold it close to your chest and say, not this one, then you've shown who your God is. You've shown You can send me to hell, but I'm not letting go of this. That's a very, very dangerous place to be. And if that's where you are, listen, contentment shows your heart. Contentment shows your idols. Contentment shows your love. If you're not content in any situation, it shows your love is not Christ first, it's this thing first. It's my comfort first. It's my family member first. It's my sexual desires being satisfied first. It's whatever you put up. And if that thing gets touched, that thing does not get met. Your dreams and your goals do not get answered in the way that you would have. Well, God said he'll give me the desires of my heart. If you submit to God first, if you cling to God first, then the desires of your heart change to want him He's not going to give you the wicked, sinful desires of your heart. You'll chase after them, though. And that's the path that leads to death. But listen, again, this is not not perfection. It doesn't mean that there will not be stumbling in this. 3, 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the, on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteous under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Isn't it ironic 
that people take Philippians 4.13 to mean my dreams, my goals, that's the highest standard. And I can do all things through Christ, all things through him who strengthens me. And that's what I'm going after. And here we have Paul saying all of my dreams, all of my goals, everything that I strove for, you know what I count them as? Rubbish. Nothing, less than nothing compared to knowing Christ. It's amazing. It's amazing. In the same letter that people would idolize dreams and goals is the same letter where Paul takes all of those idols and crushes them under the feet of Christ and says, there is nothing greater than him. And I want to know him and share in his sufferings. And that is above everything else. Business ventures, education ventures, family, high status, money, everything. Anything that you would count as gain, I count it as a loss compared to knowing him. Anything that you would look at and say, that's beautiful, that's achievable, that's what I want, that's what I'm striving after. He says, you look at that and I see trash. Not that there's anything sinful about wanting to do better in life. Praise the Lord. Don't be a, you know, Pastor Tim and I, we talked about working and how the Bible encourages you to work and commands you to work. And there are benefits to working. You want to do better? Praise the Lord. Do better in your job. You want to get more education? Praise the Lord. Get more education. But you count that thing as your final goal. You count that thing as your dream and your aspiration. You hold on to that thing even if Christ says, you know what? No, I don't want you to go to college. I want you to go to the mission field. Well, no, that's my dream. You know what? I don't want you to do this business deal because they do shady business and you're going to miss out on a lot of money, but you're going to walk in integrity. But that's so much money. Again, you've shown your heart. You've shown your idol. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That's the motivation. Was Paul perfect in this? No, he tells you, not that I'm perfect. (laughs) I haven't reached that Final level of I count everything at all times as rubbish. No, that's when we sin. When do we sin? Christian, when you count something that should be rubbish as treasure. When you count something that should be a loss as a gain. When you take your eyes off of the supreme treasure and put it on temporal things, earthly things, sinful things. So no, he had not reached the status of perfection that at all times, always, he counted Christ as the supreme treasure and never counted anything else as a treasure. If that were the case, that's heaven. (laughs) That's what will be in paradise. We will continuously, always see Christ as our infinite treasure and never again take our eyes off of him. We will never again stumble, never again fall, never again sin. We shall never again have our heart lifted towards anything but the lover of our souls. And we will spend an eternity basking in his beauty, celebrating his magnificence, rejoicing and worshiping him for the sacrifice that he made. That's heaven. But on this earth, the Christian, we struggle, we wrestle We fight, we do battle, we wage war, and sometimes we fall. But you don't stay down there, you get up and you fix your eyes back on Christ and you continually go after him. But there's contentment there. Why? Because Christ has made me his own. So, verse, uh, now we're in chapter 4. We're getting closer to 13. You see how this is building up. Contentment in any situation, regardless of the, regardless of the event. 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. 
But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Look, there are things in this world that will try to make us anxious. Paul told us one of them. Look, he had a lot of things to be concerned about. Many things were going, quote unquote, wrong in his life. And then he also had the constant thought of the many churches. And he was praying for the believers daily. He was always mentioning them in his prayers. And the fact that he loved these believers and he didn't want them to fall away and he wanted them to continue in the faith. And this brought about some anxiety in him. But what does he tell us? What does the Lord tell us? Paul is, you know, even preaching to himself there. Don't be anxious about anything. So what should we do then? In everything, we take it to God in prayer. But what if God tells you no? What if you're in the midst of suffering and trial and you say, Lord, am I just supposed to not tell you that this hurts no he says make your request known to God tell him God this hurts this suffering is intense Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane father three times if there's any way that this cup can pass three times there's nothing sinful about making your request known to God there's nothing in fact we're told this don't be anxious but pray tell God but what if he says no like he told Jesus no then the peace that surpasses all understanding. I don't understand how I can have peace in the midst of suffering. Christ, you're about to face the wrath of God. How can you have peace? How can you be quiet? How can you go to the cross and not be screaming? Why aren't you sweating great drops of blood anymore, Christ? The peace that surpasses all understanding. How do we get that? Because we find contentment, how? In God, in Christ. Not my will, but yours be done. What does that imply? It implies trusting the sovereignty of God. It implies knowing about God that He is good, that He is kind, that He is loving, that all things truly do work together for the good of those who love Him. God, I'm in the midst of intense suffering. And I don't understand this, but I have peace here because I know that you love me, because I know that you are good, because I know that you are in control of all things. This is not outside of your hands. In fact, this is in your will to bring about the good for me, to bring me closer to the image of Christ. This is bringing about the help of those who are around. We saw that in the first chapter. The suffering of Paul was bringing about the proclamation of the gospel in more boldness. The suffering of Joseph brought about the good of many. It preserved the life of many. It brought about the preservation of the seed of Christ. Because Judah survived, because he was able to eat, because Joseph was put in a place where he reserved food. And that food allowed Joseph, uh, rather Judah, to live to bring about, to continue the seed that would bring us the promised Messiah. It surpasses all understanding. Like we looked at earlier, it shows our salvation and their destruction to have contentment. It will guard our hearts. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to the word. Not just sexual purity. To guard it against the lies and the slander of the enemy who would seek to come in and tell you lies. See, you're suffering, God doesn't care. See, you're suffering, God doesn't love you. See, you're suffering, you're not a Christian. Your heart is guarded by the word. Your heart is guarded by Christ Jesus. So when those things seek to come into your heart, into your mind, it is guarded by the word, by Christ. It 
So let's keep going until we get to 13, and then we'll see how, what it truly means. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. We saw him suffering and we saw contentment. Practice these things. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Notice he's rejoicing because they revived concern, which is a evidence of salvation. If anyone does not love his brother, he's not a Christian. To have love for the brethren is a fruit, is evidence that you are truly a believer. To have concern for your brother that is suffering, that's evidence that you're truly his. And Paul is greatly rejoicing that they revived concern. Look at verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, That's not what he's talking about. It's not about him. It's not about his need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and And need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Do you see how crazy it is to look at this verse as some type of look? I can reach my goals. I can have my way. That's what I want. In light of everything that we've seen in Philippians, in light of the very context of this verse talking about, look, this isn't about me. This isn't about my need. Was Paul in need? Yeah, he he was in need. He, He really did need things. But he's like, no, this isn't about me. I've learned to be content in any situation, in every situation. In fact, we've looked at many of the situations that he was content in. No, he was rejoicing about the revival of their concern for one of their fellow brothers in the faith. That's what he rejoiced in. His contentment is, no matter what the situation, whether I have a lot or I have a little, I know the secret. What's the secret? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So let's look at that real quick. Who's the I? The I is the Christian, first and foremost. <laughs> Paul is talking, but he's te- he already told them, what you see in me, practice. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. This is called for all Christians. We're called to be content, regardless of the situation. So who's the I? It's not the unbeliever. And that's what often happens. You know, you get, you, someone graduates from high school or college, you go to the Christian bookstore, you find a greeting card. I'm so proud of you that you graduated from, from high school. This is only the beginning. And at the bottom, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Here you go. This is for you. Whoa, how many of us have done that? I have. <laughs> it's not what it means. It's not for them. This is a promise for the Christian. So who's the I? I is the Christian. I can do all things. What is the can do all things? What is that? That's being content in any situation. That's what that is. It's not, I have these dreams and I want to reach them. Nothing is impossible and I'm going after it. I have athletic aspirations. I have educational aspirations. I have family aspirations. I have goals and things that I want to achieve and I can do all things. That's not what this means. It means, he tells you in the very context what the secret is. It is, I can do all things. What is the all things you're talking about, Paul? Whether I abound or whether I am in poverty, I'm content. How? That's the next question, right? 
through him who strengthens me. Well, how does he strengthen us? He opens our eyes to behold his beauty and his sufficiency. That's what we've been seeing in Paul throughout the whole book. Looking to Christ. Notice how many times he reverts back to Christ, back to Christ, back to the Lord Jesus, back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back in your own time and look and notice how many times he's reverting back to Christ. That's how. The more your eyes are open to behold his beauty, the more you will find contentment. The more your eyes are open to behold his sufficiency, the more you will have contentment. And this works as much in poverty as it does in riches. Because when riches abound, believe there is temptation to find your sufficiency in yourself, to find sufficiency in your paycheck, to find your sufficiency in the joy of having things. And when things are lacking, there's the temptation to say, God, where are you? I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. This is too hard. I didn't sign up for this. There's a need in both poverty and in riches. And the need is found in Christ. And he gives you the strength. And where does the strength come from? In beholding his beauty, fixing your eyes on Christ. And that's how you can do all things, i.e., be content regardless of the situation. Any time in your life that you have not been content is because you have not been beholding Christ. Lay it down. That's a rule every time. And any time you have resisted the temptation to find reliance in yourself, it's been because you have been fixed upon Christ every time. That's where our help comes from. That's where our strength comes from. Then finally and quickly, this mindset is the pathway to hell. In Philippians 3, 18, look at what this says. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, Walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Who are these enemies, Paul? Let's find out. Let's see who these enemies are. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Their God is their belly. The common understanding of Philippians 4.13 is telling people that let your God be your belly. Living for your own pleasure, for your goals, your dreams, your will. Whatever will please you, whatever will satisfy you, whatever you want, that's what you go after. That's what this verse is being put up as. Let your God be your belly. Let your God be your goals. Let your God be your dreams. Let your God be that which appeases you, which pleases you. Whatever gives you comfort. Who's going to sign up for that which is uncomfortable? We switch chairs because they're not comfortable. Who's going to sign up for a life of discomfort? Well, if your God is your belly, you will. And this verse has been ripped out of its context and represented in a way that encourages people to make their God their belly. You don't believe it? Listen to some of the sermons that this verse is quoted as being the foundation of. Listen to your Joel Osteens and all, don't really, but if you, if you, if you don't believe me, go and investigate and see. And that's exactly how it's being put forth. You can do whatever you want What if God is not for that? You can do whatever you want, and God will help you. They glory in their shame. What should bring us as Christians shame? Sin, pride, self-reliance. 
This is the very thing that is being celebrated when this verse is being ripped out of his context. The fact that you can do all things. Nothing is impossible for you. You say, wait, wait, wait a minute. But they say, through him, through Christ. But think about how Christ is being put forward. Basically as a butler. I can do all things that I want to do and God's going to help me do it. I have my goals and Jesus is going to help me get accomplished. God is not a butler. Jesus is not your genie. He is the God Almighty. He is the Lord who sits upon the throne. He is the ruler of the heavens and the highest heavens. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is no one's butler. He is no one's errand boy. But that's how this verse is being put forward. You have dreams, go for them, and God's going to help you get them. He will not do your bidding. He is not the supplier of your energy to get done what you want done. With minds set on earthly things. You remember what Jesus told Peter? Uh, Jesus asked them, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My Father who is in heaven. Immediately after this, Jesus goes on to say, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be delivered onto the hands of sinners. He will be crucified, but on the third day he will rise. And what did Peter say? Pulled him aside, rebuked him. No, my Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus rebuked him. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Why? Because your mind is set on the things of men and not on the things of God. Minds that are set on earthly things. Jesus going to the cross. Uh, We don't want our king to suffer. What did Jesus say to everyone who wants to, to follow him? If anyone will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. How is this verse being put forward? Do not deny yourself. Well, you can't have it both ways. If you're going to come after Christ, you need to deny yourself. Does that mean you can't have dreams? No. Does that mean you can't have goals? No. But it means this. If Jesus says no, you lay that thing down. If Jesus says you're going this way, you don't hold on to that thing. You deny yourself. You take up your cross daily. What is the purpose of the cross? The purpose of the cross was to die. Execution. When are we supposed to die? Every day. Deny yourself. Die daily. How? How do I die daily? I die daily to my wants, to my goals, to my desires. I die daily to to everything that would make me the master of my soul. Everything that would make me the, the, the Lord of my life. And I follow Christ, who though he was God, did not count equality a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. We follow in his steps, who humbled himself, who suffered, who lived his life, not boasting in his ability, though he is completely God, but he humbled himself under his Father's will, even when it meant death even death on a cross. This verse is being put forward and it's encouraging people to not deny themselves, to not die daily, to not follow Christ, but to indulge in their own passions and their own dreams at the cost of everything and is making God their genie. Listen, if you don't know Christ, that's how you live your life. You live your life for yourself. You lean to your own understanding. There's a way that seems right to you, and that's the way you go. You follow the path that you have laid out for yourself. And I'm telling you, that way leads to destruction. We are told in this very verse, what is the end of this? 
Their end is destruction. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Let's just say, and I'm going to close with this. You don't know the Lord, okay? Or you're not sure. This is the way you live your life. You live your life for you. And it's been a fun journey because you get to do whatever you want to do. But let's say that you're in an airport, standing in the security line. You already have your bags checked. You already have your ticket, your boarding pass, everything. You're ready to go. And I approach you, and I say, listen, don't get on this flight. I know this is going to sound crazy. You're not going to believe me. But that flight that you're going on is going to be hijacked, and it's going to be flown into a building, and it's going to burn and everyone on it is going to die and I'm telling you please don't get on that flight probably think I was crazy may not listen and they would get on that flight and they would see their end as destruction if I had a newspaper if I was somehow able to go back in time and say look this newspaper says it this plane is going to crash they would say, ah, you made that. You did that on the internet. Or would you listen? Well, I don't have a time machine, and this is not 2001, and I don't have a newspaper that says you're getting on a flight, but I have the very word of Almighty God, and that's better. And he tells you this. If you go down that path, if you get on that plane, the end is destruction, and that's a promise. You live for yourself. You live for your pride. You live for your goals and your dreams instead of what Christ showed us. Not my will, but yours be done. The only way to follow Christ is to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him. If you seek any other way, if you live any other way, I'm telling you, that is the way of destruction. And I'm pleading with you, don't get on that plane. I'm pleading with you, if you're already seated, you're already buckled up, get off that plane. Get off that path. Repent. Trust Christ. For that is the way that leads to eternal life.